There's a, a graphic description of the servant of God in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, penned by the Apostle Paul, a whole series of statements that appear to be contradictions, the paradoxical life of the servant of God. For example, he says, as deceivers and yet true, as dying and behold, we live. The reports of our demise are exaggerated. As chastened and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, and has having nothing, and yet possessing all things. The one that I left out, as unknown and yet well known. And that's the one I want to emphasize. There are a whole series of characters in the Bible who we know very well, and yet we don't know their names. For example, the widow that cast in her two mites into the treasury, and many others who were servants of God, who were people of God, and only God knows their name. There are millions of such people. When we look at church history, it's very European. What about the believers in Africa? What happened when the Ethiopian eunuch got back and began to tell about a treasury that he found that Queen Candace didn't have in her treasury? What about the spread of the gospel to India in the first century with Thomas and to China and to uh, Europe? We, we have no idea. There were many millions, no doubt, of faithful servants of God, and we don't know anything about them. But we're looking forward to finding out and to getting to know them in the glory. But I wanted to remind you of a little story. Everybody has heard the story of Paul Revere. Paul Revere's famous ride on April 18, 1775. It was a, about a two-hour journey, I think, but he spread the news that the British had attacked Lexington and Concord, and he roused the people to fight against the British. Uh, what we don't know is, perhaps as well, is that the next day, there was another rider, a 23-year-old dispatch rider named Israel Bissell, who was sent south to take the same message. Not a matter of a couple of hours, but a matter of six days in which he rode 350 miles on horseback. They say that when he got to Worcester, Massachusetts, his horse dropped dead underneath him. He took another horse and he kept up the ride spreading the news and stirring up the people uh, to realize that the war had begun. So when we think about how God writes the story, he doesn't always fill in all the details. Remember the story of the seven that went fishing after the resurrection of Christ. Peter said, I go a fishing, and we read of five names and two unknown. And so it is over and over again in the history of the church. There are many of God's dear people. Who takes out the garbage at your local church? Who pays the light bill? Even who looks after the little children in the nursery? Very often, we put our focus on the two square feet behind the pulpit, and we forget the scores of people who go out and visit the widow and the shut-in and make the hospital visits and do preparation behind the scenes preparing meals, taking food to people that are hungry, and on and on the list goes. But the day will declare it. The hidden things will be manifested, and everyone will have praise of God. So just a little reminder, um, we're not in heaven yet. <laughs> we have to wait a bit. Uh, it's not true, so send I you to labor unrewarded. The reward is waiting. And we'll see that in a day to come. So I speak to all of you who are doing some quiet service behind the scenes, writing letters to missionaries, counting the money, uh, handling the banking, and a thousand other things, picking up children for Sunday school. Never get your photo on the front page of the magazine. But God notices and he cares about this. 
And the Apostle Paul would write these words as unknown and yet well known. I'd rather be a who's he down on earth and a who's who in heaven than to be a who's who on earth and a who's he in heaven.